So, I wanted to start by talking about um, ice cream. Uh, so, because everyone loves ice cream, right? So, this picture is from 2009, and um, the smiley man in the middle, uh, that's Ben from Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. Um, I've no idea what Jerry was doing. He, he was busy, I don't know, we couldn't get Jerry, but we definitely got Ben. So this is Ben from Ben & Jerry's hanging out at ThoughtWorks Chicago headquarters with our then leadership team. Um, they were hanging out, talking ice cream, doing good things. I'm guessing they were discussing this. So Ben & Jerry's has this sort of three core values thing about a product mission, an economic mission, and a social mission. It's properly cool, um, plus everyone likes ice cream. And then just a few short weeks later, an email came out of our leadership team telling us about this new thing we'd invented um, that we now had three pillars. So ThoughtWorks has been around for 25 years. As of last year, we've had three pillars for, you know, 10 years, and we totally didn't borrow them from anyone else. <laughs> so then, <laughs> then last summer, this opened, this is next to our London office where I work, and I'm like, ah, they're, they're, they're onto us. And if they weren't before, they, they probably are now because I've just announced it on a live stream. Anyway, so Kelsey and I work at ThoughtWorks. Yeah. So for anybody who hasn't heard of ThoughtWorks, most people, most, which is most people, um, we're a software development um, consultancy, a community of passionate individuals, as it says on the website. Um, we do disruptive things to address various client challenges um, in a wide-ranging set of fields, but mostly about building software. And we have a mission to revolutionise the IT industry and create positive social change. Right. And this is ThoughtWorks. This is where all of our various offices are. Um, I think 41 or 42 offices in 14 different countries. They keep opening new ones and um, not telling us about it. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we find them randomly. <laughs> And um, so we work for TechOps, which is our internal IT um, organisation, and we make up part of the identity team, and that's us. Mm -hmm. And there are seven of us spread across the globe, covering... Yeah, look, look, that's me in London, look. That's you, I'm yeah. A, I'm and a then, small pink block. Yeah, and that's me, oh. way down there. Yeah. So, as you can see, we've had a lot of opportunity to get in a room and practice this together. It's true. Um, it's true. Actually, it is, I was going to say, it's really weird for me to be in the same physical space as a Kelsey. Normally, our interactions are through, like, Zoom, and Zoom. I'm like, like, like this or like this. Everything. And, in fact, maybe... We wrote the whole deck that way. Should I put a headset on? It'll be, anyway, it fine. So, so this is awesome. So, Matt, thanks for letting us get together and hang out, because um, we don't get to do it anywhere near as much as we would like. Um, anyway, yeah. so, who are we? Yeah, so forever. We'll get there eventually, right? <laughs> We will. So this is me. I'm the product owner, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> I actually have the job because nobody else applied for it. Product owner of identity. Nobody knew what that was. I applied and got the job. When I figure out what it is, I'll let you know. Um, but I, I basically look after eight unicorns um, across 17 time zones and we deliver and our identity and access management product to, at the moment, about 7,000 thought workers, but growing at a rate of something ridiculous. 100 and something a month. Um, it's really exciting for me. So I'm Steve Quirk, and I've been upgraded to Unicorn. I never used to be a unicorn. I've been called lots of things, but not a unicorn. Um, but by definition, Kelsey's team, unicorn. So uh, I'm a Mac admin of sorts. Um, I'm trying to learn a bit of DevOps, so that's awkward, because here I am. Um, and yeah, so um, we did, we, I think we've agreed that device management has, it falls under the identity banner. That, that you know, it's the, the identity of a, of a device that door works. And so it's, it's in our P patch. It's ours. Yes. So, um, so this is the story of three pillars that we didn't repeat, did not steal from Ben and or Jerry. So I'm going to pass you to Oh, thank you so much. Um, so just to make it really clear that we didn't steal our pillars from Ben and Jerry, I've talked for a little a little bit about what the pillars mean to us. So for us, we have P P1, which is about running a sustainable business. And for us, running a, a sustainable business is two things. It's about not going after, if you like, the quick dollar or the fast dollar necessarily, but looking for engagements where we can work really long term with clients, where we can build something for the future um, and contribute 
to the work that they're doing in a really meaningful way. And it's also about long-term relationships, not only with clients, but with vendors, with partners, in fact, with thought workers. Mm -hmm. um, P2 is technical excellence, and that's about being the most excellent builders of the most excellent software. And not only for our clients, but also to contribute that back to the community as a whole and to try very actively to improve the quality of software engineering and software development as, as a craft, if you like, as a skill. And then finally, there's P3, which is economic and social justice. And that's not only about doing good work, and we do a fair bit of pro bono or low bono work and get quite actively involved in causes that we care about, but it's also about looking really broadly at the impact that we make as a, as a company, and that's, again, partially around the work that we do, but a whole lot of other initiatives as well. Whatever we do, we try to ask, how can what we are doing make the world a better place in some way, shape, or form? So, now we'll start the presentation. So it started with a perfect storm of events, this little journey. Early in 2018, as all the folks in this room know, um, Mac Apple started to make some changes to Mac OS, which meant that our traditional ways of setting up and imaging laptops were not going to work for us anymore. We needed to ch make changes. There was no option. And we were experiencing rapid organisational growth. We have a goal to get to 10,000 thought workers within two years to be a billion dollar company. So, and, and we're hiring. This is the bit where I have to throw that yeah, in there. Yeah, and we're hiring. You know. um, while we want to grow to 10,000 thought workers, we don't want to grow our operations function at the same rate. So that means getting efficient and scaling things um, in a cost effective manner. So we were in this situation, we needed to change what we were doing, what we were currently doing wasn't going to work, and really the answer to this particular problem was we had to engage with some kind of device management. We had none previously. Which is where it gets interesting. Note the pitchforks mm -hmm. in the picture. <laughs> we first had a go at this back in 2015 didn't go well. We'd purchased a fairly traditional and very well-known product. Um, and we'd done a trial, and we'd started to talk about implementing, rolling out this product to thought workers. And um, we've always had a strong feedback culture. I will say that. And there was feedback. Mm. Um, with pitchforks. People were not happy. They were not happy about the fact that they felt we hadn't been consultative enough. They were not happy about the fact that there was a perception that we were invading people's privacy. Previously, we would give you, here is your MacBook. Bye. Hopefully we'll see bring, in a couple of years. Bring it back when you're finished. Yeah, or you need a new one. Um, there was a serious problem with the fact that the product that we'd chosen used a closed source binary agent. And as I mentioned earlier, we're a technology company. Most of our staff, most of our, most thought workers are, in fact, software engineers, software developers. They don't want anything on their machine that they can't take a look at, that they don't know what it's doing. Um, so that really wasn't going to fly. And after quite a lot of very robust Discussions? Robust discussions, yeah, that's Shall we say? Yeah, yeah. robust discussions. Um, we decided that was probably not the moment. Come 2017, um, another vendor that we were already working with developed a product that we thought, okay, this might be pretty much what we need. It was agentless. Um, we were able to be really transparent with it. Um, we were able to, importantly, we were able to ask that particular vendor to remove the ability to remote wipe a machine. That had been something that was very contentious previously as well, um, and just allow remote lock. And it was going very nicely. We did a trial and 
just as we were about to roll out, they discontinued the product. Back to the drawing board. Then comes along the perfect storm that I mentioned in 2018, and we really had to move forward. But this time we thought, okay, P3 first. And then obviously the shameless self-promotion, the longer version of this is the talk I did at Macaduck uh, a year ago. So you can find the video and uh, see yes. me stumble through a different slide deck. So we had some requirements from an MDM vendor. Closed source binary agents are unwelcome. We do not want one. Under any circumstances, that's just not a conversation that we can have in our organisation, which just it is what it is. Yes, um, we needed to be transparent. We needed to be totally transparent about what we were doing, what product we were using, how we were building it. Um, we needed to have a product that was straightforward and where people could understand exactly how it was working. We needed to be culturally acceptable to thought workers for the reasons that we've talked about above. And whatever solution we had had to be inclusive. We have people speaking multiple different languages. There is, for example, no requirement to speak English to be a thought worker, um, which can make some of our help desk tickets a bit of an adventure. Google so translates, my friend. Google translate and that. It's basically fine. Um, but we needed to be able to build a solution for everybody. It had to be accessible. So to do that, we needed a whole chunk of pillar two. And that's where I'm going to shut up and hand over to Ooh. Steve, who knows something about technology. Uh -oh. well, you say that, but you're the one who full screened the deck, so I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, also, the word excellent was used more than I would like uh, in, the, in the lead up. But, so I guess we started with something called hypothesis development, hypothesis driven development, rather, that we wrote down all the things we actually wanted to see we could achieve, first of all. Um, and we had a six week trial. Um, where our senior stakeholders wanted results at the end of, well, three weeks, to be honest. But, um, and that was kind of scary because, as we all know, imaging is dead. And if we don't get the sign-off for this MDM, what the hell are we actually going to do? So no pressure, but that was fine. Um, so it's can we replace our, our current device imaging, our device provisioning with zero touch? Um, we actually didn't really necessarily want any device management per se. I think we were happy to provision a device. So for us, that meant um, some, prof some profiles to do some, some hardening, you know, password policies, file vault and stuff, an antivirus product. And we're happy with that, to be honest, because our end users are administrators and they can choose to install and patch and update or not. But at least the MDM gives us that visibility. But we don't want to do the big brother stuff. We just don't. And then the other really exciting bit was we've also changed to a new asset management system because everyone loves ServiceNow. And um, can we add devices to ServiceNow at the same time? Can we make that part of the enrollment process? Um, and that was really important because we had a team in India chomping at the bit, clutching their barcode scanners and their Bluetooth things and their shonky import scripts because they couldn't wait to start getting data into ServiceNow. And we're like, why the hell would you do that? We're about to roll out an MDM, which has all the data. Well, you know, no fat fingers required. It will just work. And so that's kind of changed the direction in some respects, because the initial trial was, can we do zero touch provisioning? And it turned into, can we enroll 7,000 people within a few months and get all that data into service now? Um, so cloud first. So I'm, I mean, we're nothing special in that regard, but ThoughtWorks is a cloud first org. So anything we buy has to be cloud hosted. It has to um, you know, have SSO. We use Opta, of course. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, pull we're pulling hardware out, actually. So, um, which gets challenging. So SimpleMDM is the vendor we went with. Um, we'd used it to great success for our Zoom meeting rooms. We were really pleased with it for that. And so we figured, let's, let's go for it. Let's try this out on laptops too. Um, because our previous, the previous thing we tried did do agentless MDM, but it didn't do DEP. So actually, you know, this was step into the duck. The other thing that's awesome is, of course, Simple is cloud-hosted. You can't buy an on-prem edition of uh, SimpleMDM, thank goodness. Um, and it can scale from you know, a few hundred clients to a few thousand. So I think we're at about 3,500 right now, and we are busy prepping ourselves for the rest of China rollout and stuff. But because it's agentless and it's simple, then we will need some additional components to do what we need to do. Um, so I'm torn on this one because I was, I was really sort of yay open source, and then I was here yesterday, and now I don't know how I feel about open source because I feel like, I feel like I'm opening raw wounds. Now. But it's fine. It's okay. Um, but it's back to that notion of, of transparency, right? So we have six weeks, and we need to get stuff working. If we go with open source code, then our end users can see 
the code, they can see what it does. Um, if, and we open source our own code as we go, so you can see how excellent it is or isn't. Um, so again, I stumbled upon, through the, the Slack community, I stumbled upon a series of blog posts by Eric Gomez where he talked about uh, installed applications and the decisions he'd made around that tool. Um, and that th he felt that the, the UI part, having something like DP Notify to provide end user feedback was really important. And I was like, yep, I'm cool with that. Um, we can build that. And we were able to get that turned around in a, in a week or so and start doing our zero touch stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, but we hit, we hit a snag fairly early on, which is that if we delivered a file vault profile to a device during setup assistant, it kind of didn't really work. Um, I still have a theory it's because there, if there's not a user account on the box, but whatever. So the solution was, it's fine. We will enroll the device without file vault, then we'll wait till it hits the desktop and we'll deliver the file vault profile afterwards. And the suggestion was we could use the simple MDM API to do that. Um, it's pretty well documented, it's, it's out there, it's cool. But the problem with the API is it only has a root level key. I've got a feature request in with Taylor for like different levels of access. Because, so I can't just stick that root level key in a shonky shell script on someone's laptop, not just because of the excellent excellence thing, but because if someone gets that key, they can do mischief with it. So this is an excuse for me to write my very first AWS Lambda. Because I was dead scared of those, because they sounded like the sort of things that real developers could do. Um, but we sat down, I, I did some local code on my laptop, just you know, in Python, and got it playing around. I copied and pasted some stuff into the AWS console and ran it there and changed things I, like an animal, I think is, uh, you know. And, and I prodded and I poked, and um, eventually we had something that, that, that worked, um, which was cool. So, so it was a mixture of API, uh, yeah, API Gateway and Lambda. So a device would send its serial number to API Gateway, it would trigger a device move, it would move into a different group in Simple MDM. Everything was cool. But we haven't done the registration piece. So, um, we then built a registration app, uh, and we called it Rollzog. And we called it Rollzog because no one should let me name apps ever. Um, in my defense, we kind of backronymed it to register our laptops with, with zero grief. And if you squint, you, you, I almost get away with it. Um, we used a fantasy name generator. We, you know, that's, we couldn't start the code that we had a name for the Git repo, and it, everyone hates me. Um, so we built this lightweight Python Flask SAML app. And originally it ran on Elastic Beanstalk. Because that isn't buzzwordy enough, we had to move it to serverless. Um, so basically, it just takes a serial number and an Octa assertion, you know, a SAML assertion, and sends that over to Lambda. And then Lambda does stuff with it. Um, so at the moment, that actually triggers the device move in Simple MDM, and it sends a full list. I think we actually take the full list of all the data you can get from Simple, and we send that to ServiceNow. And then we've got code in ServiceNow that picks out the bits we're interested in. Um, but yeah, also, um, if you look in the London Slack channel, and of course, why would you? You're in Vancouver. Um, there's a whole sort of sub thing about Artisanal. Um, Artisanal doesn't really scale. So I built this whole API gateway lambda thing by hand, like an animal. And I came back to it three weeks later, and I couldn't actually figure out how the hell I'd actually got any of it to work in the first place. And couldn't, <laughs> and couldn't really mess with it, because it was kind of in prod for this emergency six week must ever, everything must work trial. Um, so as a result, you know, I, I turned to serverless instead. I mean, again, the AWS console, if you spend any time there, I get the impression that the UI designers don't want you to spend time there, and they are punishing you for doing so. Learn the CLI, Steve, fine. Um, so enter serverless. So serverless is a framework written in Node, and it allows you to kind of replace this much cloud formation, which is impenetrable, to you know, this much almost penetrable YAML. Um, that said, what I find really nice about some of the getting started docs with, um, with serverless is it's kind of fun to spin it up like a hello world example, then go to the console, like an animal, and look at what it's actually built and deployed and go, all right, that's what that UI, that's what it means. So it, I found that really helpful, actually, just to, to play around with, with serverless. It's also sort of pseudo vendor agnostic because it's supposed to work against all the vendors, but actually it's very, very, very tightly integrated with AWS. But for me, being able to sort of define everything as code was awesome because we could then move it to different accounts and do loads of clever things. Um, but that's not enough cloudy things for buzzword stuff. Um, so the other thing we'd done, actually, um, in terms of the excellent piece, is we'd separated out our dev and prod environments. So we had separate, entirely separate AWS instances for dev and prod. Um, and a colleague of ours, Powen, had found this cool tool called seed.run. And it's a serverless-focused CI CD tool. And it's designed specifically for kind of this sort of use case. You build stuff in dev and you hit buttons and it promotes the prod and does tests. You can look at all your CloudWatch logs in one place. It's keeping you up the AWS console. Are you just, there's a theme there, I think. Um, 
So what you can see is we build an awful lot of stuff in dev and we never push to prod. Um, most of those are me just fixing typos. So. Um, but that's the other problem. So um, I can't deploy Mac packages with MDM unless they've been signed. Um, I, need a, I need a Mac box to do that. I do have a bunch of dead Deploy Studio servers, I suppose, but we're pulling all the servers out and I have nowhere to put one. So I need some way of doing cloud-hosted um, Mac package builds. So luckily for me, I was in Canada this time last year uh, and I saw Jessica Dean's awesome 10 minute sort of quick talk about building anything, or almost anything, in uh, Visual Studio Team Services, which they've rebranded as your DevOps, you know, probably to make Matt happy, right? Because it fits the, the theme. So basically, um, I get uh, 1,800 minutes a month <laughs> of Microsoft hosted, um, you know, Mac agents. I can upload my, cert, my signing certs and I can build stuff and export that out to AWS or I can upload it directly into simple MDM after we ask for a feature request to let us modify binaries that way. Um, so again, pretty cool. And I've not done much with pipelines before, and I actually found that the Azure DevOps UI is kind of cool if you've never done much stuff with pipelines, because it has this weird sort of hybrid thing where you can drag UI elements around and watch the, the and then it generates more YAML and you can sort of learn as you go. It's pretty cool, I, I like it a lot. So then, putting it all together, does it actually work? I really hope so, because otherwise, you know, what are we doing here? Um, so like I said, 3,000 plus devices. Um, and the kicker for me is we received an email the other day from our software licensing team saying, we're going to close down your AWS production account because we don't think you're using it. So that's good to know. So what we're saying is our Lambda compute time, you know, our cost for Lambda and our cost for S3 are so low that our software team cannot tell that we're using it at all. Pretty cool. <laughs> So I guess the, the next thing is we demo. So if I just commit some code and we can watch a bunch of stuff, but we're not gonna, that'd be really boring. No one actually wants to watch code build. It's kind of like watching paint dry. So what I was gonna do instead is show what the user experience is like, because that's vaguely more exciting, he says. And yet I've used Google Slides, and so no, I can't do that. See, it's, it watches, it mocks me. Um, Will it let you do it from there? Like I do, well, I've got it here. I can just show it, like, you know. We do that. And now I feel sad there's this whole build up for a video that's not that exciting. <laughs> um, so, what we're doing for registering existing devices is we're actually, we've written a, we've wrapped a, written a little package. Um, so, we deliver debt notify, um, we tidy up the previous simple installation. We ask your language because that's going to be a big deal when we roll out to China and Brazil. Um, and then we have something to provide user feedback. Effectively, what happened was when we initially got people to enroll via an enrollment link, their feedback was, so I enrolled. Now the hell, what happens? You know, they're waiting for install application or install enterprise application to trigger, and they, they haven't got any feedback. So this way, we can give them some feedback that something might happen if they're lucky. Um, at which point we then deliver a, a quick log to Sumo so we can check that the process is actually working. We check for an installed antivirus if it isn't there. It blows my mind how many machines we're catching out in the wild that people have promised they have antivirus and they totally don't. The Sumo logic logs don't lie. And then this is, our, this is, this is Rollzog. So we've actually modified Debt Notify. So we're using the web view to launch our little web app. So kudos to Joel, by the way, because he added copy-paste. It didn't used to support copy-paste, and I, you know, we tell all of our users to use password vaults, and I'm testing it, going, why isn't paste? Oh, well, shh. But he fixed it, and that's awesome. And yay, we're done. So this laptop is now enrolled. It's got antivirus. Uh, we can manage in simple MDM, and we're pretty happy. Ooh. And, and you it's know, I get, and I get. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and better yet, the user, the information about this laptop and which thought worker it was assigned to and when they do a replacement and so on and so forth is also sitting in service now yeah. for the asset management team and the finance so, so, so team they're happy to deal is, with. And, and keeping them happy is no really hands. important because they drag us to a lot of meetings. Um, <laughs> the other thing that was fun to discover, Rich, we wrote all this code again to 10.13, 10.14 and we discovered 10.11, 10.10. <laughs> MDM is our friend. Um, anyway. Yes, indeed. All right. So, pillar one, I guess, wraps it all up. Um, as you can see, this has been a piece of work that has required people across multiple continents, pairing remotely, working together. Um, 
products and product developers, product vendors who were really happy to listen to our often crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, why would you want to remove remote wipe from a corporate mm -hmm. device? Pitchforks, Just, you know, man, pitchforks. Trust, trust us, we do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> various other things. Um, various other products. So simple MDM, of course, we've talked about. They've been awesome, kudos. The support um, team as well, actually. When I, when I do raise a ticket, when I get a response, it's always a very intelligent response, <laughs> which makes me wish I'd not asked such so many silly questions. Um, yep, um, Okta, whom we've worked with for a long time, who are also pretty interested in the kind of crazy thing that we're doing with their IDP um, and service now. Um, and partnerships, and the partnerships with those vendors, the products that they make, the partnerships. And most importantly, the ability and the willingness and importance, I guess, of being able to share this back to the community of ThoughtWorks, encouraging us to share back the work that we've done to offer up the solutions that we've developed and to say to people, if anybody sees things that we've done here that they would find useful, come and talk to us and we'd love to have um, further conversations about it. I mean, for me, I think as well, you've got this community here, you've got Slack, you've got the open source stuff, and it yeah. means that we can do cool things, all of us. So thanks, everyone. Um, and, and thanks to Matt for making an awesome conference happen and giving me the excuse to come to sunny Vancouver. Yeah. And there's the links to the repositories. Um, and there will be more stuff. I think we've, we've open sourced a few bits and bobs. There'll be more coming as, as there, we go. Yeah, there, there and then are if you want the, you know, the, the long and gory version of which vendors we did and didn't use and whatever, that's my talk from Macaduck. Thanks, everyone. Um.